Okay guys, so in this lecture, we're gonna talk about dentatory strategies and airway clearance techniques. So uh, these are all techniques that we can do in the clinic to um, either help uh, mobilize secretions out of patients or airway clearance techniques. Um, we can do this in the hospital, um, really in any setting, but um, airway clearance are designed to mobilize secretion. Dentatory strategies are techniques we can use to uh, improve breathing for various uh, different uh, causes or uh, complications. And we'll also go over um, some of the contraindications um, and the evidence for some of these techniques as well. Um, so again, uh, just going over some of the pathophysiological changes that can occur with ventilation. Again, going back to our whip and wasserman gain, statue stains here, if we've got impaired ventilation, right, it's gonna make these two systems have to work a little bit harder. So if we can improve this, we can you know, ultimately potentially um, improve our ability to exercise and to move around and to do things that we wanna do. So again, uh, one of the big problems that we see, especially with patients uh, with COPD, is this concept of um, dynamic hyperinflation, uh, right? They just keep trapping more in their air. They have that velocity defect. Um, you know, there's, they just have these really hyperinflated lungs. It's just, you know, um, and really kind of compressed uh, airways, um, especially during expiration, just makes it hard to get volume out. And in our restrictive defects, we've got a, you know, just an inability to get air in. Um, we can also get this, you know, small airway collapse. So again, just remembering some of the things that we see in these conditions uh, that, you know, we can treat by maybe adjusting how we breathe, uh, giving patients conscious, remember, we can, you know, override the, the autonomic and automatic, not autonomic, automatic control of breathing, right? The automatic control of breathing facilitated by the respiratory CPG. We can, we can, we can, adopt, we can adjust this temporarily um, and give people strategies that they can follow to make breathing a little bit easier, and then which in turn can make movement a little bit easier. So again, some ventilatory strategies. So the first one we'll cover is pursed lip breathing, or PLB. Pursed lip breathing involves patients exhaling through tightly pursed lips. Um, so they're gonna you know, inhale all the way, and they're gonna breathe out through pursed lips, like they're blowing out on hot soup. It's not like they're, you know, um, trying to blow out candles. You're trying to make the candles flicker, or like you're blowing out hot soup, right? The idea is that we take, you know, a normal two breath in and then four to six breaths out. We double basically um, the breathing cycle, right? Uh, remembering that for a normal breathing cycle for most individuals is going to be about five seconds, right? Um, we'll live a little bit longer. Um, again, you know, remembering that, uh, you know, we typically, you know, our expirations are roughly about three-ish seconds. Uh, so if we double that, we give ourselves a little bit more time. Why might this be effective um, for patients, especially with COPD? So what per slip breathing does ultimately, it slows down ventilation. Right? So even if they can't get the technique down super well, the person the lips, um, by slowing down breathing, it will give us the time we need to get to here. Remember, patients with obstructive defects have a velocity equation problem. They have a flow rate problem. They can get the volume out, but they need a little bit more time as we exercise, remembering that ventilation rate increases, so they even have less time. If we can give them a conscious cue to, hey, slow it down a little bit, you know, you'll you know, to get more air out. It may make them a little bit less dysmic, a little bit less short of breath. The other thought process was, well, by pursing your lips, creates a little bit of back pressure to help keep the airways open, which the evidence for that now here and there may not be super supportive of that notion. Um, really just by prolonging the breathing cycle, you give more opportunity for gas exchange, as well as for you know moving that volume out so they don't you know get into that dynamic hyperinflation during exercise where they you know hold on to more and more air as they exercise because they just can't get volume out. So if we can give them a little bit more time, right, they typically do a little bit better. Um, it's also relaxing. Focusing on breathing and breath, you know, it's this, it's, it's this kind of cyclical, um, methodical thing, and, and it can be a nice distraction point. And often patients with COPD, I see this clinically, 
they get uh, very, very like anxious because you know, every time they do something, they get really short of breath. And that can kind of feed in to the hyperventilation they experienced um, during exercise. So by giving something them that can lower those anxiety levels a little bit, give them a little bit more control, right? Because it's something they can do independently to address their symptom, that's great. So it's great for COPD, can be used for other conditions, anyone who's got a little bit of dyspnea or issues of hyperventilating. Um, but again, you know, it's, it's really a hallmark treatment for COPD just because we know if we give them a little bit more time to breathe out, they do, they do a little bit better. They have a, that velocity equation problem, right? They, they don't have a very, very small velocity, so we give them more time to cover the same distance um, as you, know, you and I would with a normal velocity or flow rate. So uh, deep, slow breathing is another technique you can use. So deep, slow breathing is a way for us to kind of calm people down, maybe to improve the symptoms of pain. Um, this is you know, um, you know, something that I use clinically all the time. Now, there are some rules out there that you know, it's gotta be like six breaths per minute, six to eight breaths per minute. Um, eh, that, uh, I don't think that matters as much. Um, the, the biggest thing is, again, if people can focus on their breathing, it has this distracting effect the evidence is pretty strong for that, that the, the effects are distraction. We have a limited number of things we can kind of focus on, right? We have, that, we have a very limited number of things we can focus on, cognitive load. So if we focus on breathing, we're often not focusing on our pain, right? Or wherever it's, you know, you know, bothering us. As well as if we decrease anxiety, right? That can also decrease our pain. Uh, so by focusing on your breathing can decrease decrease pain, decrease anxiety. And again, it's great because something people can kind of focus on. It's methodical. They can take ownership of their symptoms. So I use this a lot. But again, remembering breathing is a state-dependent thing, right? It's not, you know, it's a state-dependent thing, but we can have these conscious overrides. And then there's paced breathing breathing. So this is fantastic. So paced breathing um, is a, you know, volitional coordination of breathing with ex exercise. Remember, expiration is a passive activity. It's, it's, it's done by the recoil of the lung chest wall, right? Remember that model we showed what happens at the end of inspiration. It's a recoil. We don't really use any energy. So if people have difficulty performing tasks because breathing is so energy heavy for them, what we can do is have them take a deep breath in and then breathe out while they're performing that activity. So classic example of this would be climbing stairs. Climbing stairs, again, can be a very demanding activity, especially if someone's got a ventilatory issue, you know, like, like COPD, IPF, or any condition. So if you have them breathe in, take the volume they need in, and then breathe out as, and then have them start climbing stairs, it might make it a little bit easier for them to, to move around because um, they're expending their energy all for the stair climbing and not for breathing, right? So after they've you know fully breathed out, they can stop and restart. Um, so again, it's a way it'll slow things down a little bit. But what we often find is even if they move a little bit slower, um, they have to use these paced breathing techniques and you know expire on exertion. By just decreasing the you know, likelihood of them experiencing uh, dyspnea can make it a little bit easier for them as well, make their activity a little bit more efficient. So while it may take a little bit more time by using te these techniques, by decreasing the likelihood that they'll have dyspnea or short of breath um, actually makes the activity a little bit more efficient because right? they're not dealing with an episode where they get super short of breath, right? The great thing about pace breathing, you can use this in combination with personal breathing or other techniques. And you can incorporate it to functional activities. Like I mentioned, stair climb. You can do it during walking. You can do it during getting out of a chair, right? Because, you know, rising out of a chair requires some energy. So if you take a deep breath in and breathe out as you stand up, it can be very effective. Um, and then there's segmental breathing or facilitatory breathing. So this uses manual contacts on the, th on the thoracic wall. So basically this operates through a PNF kind of concept that I can put in a proprioceptive stimulus um, to facilitate a motor output, right? Um, so you basically you're placing your hands on the rib cage and asking the patient to breathe into your hands. 
So what this can be effective for is if people have a chest wall deficit of some kind, they're not really expanding super well into an area, maybe they've got a burn, or maybe they've got a pneumonia and they're just not breathing super well in there, by giving them a little contact there and say, hey, breathe into this segment can cue them, right, to make that, you know, doing that cognitive, you know, volitional action to breathe a little bit deeper into those areas, right? So again, very effective. Uh, this is also a great way to use um, um, on the lower lateral segments. We do this bilaterally, which we often see done to um, really encourage lower abdominal expansion um, or lower, lower rib cage expansion. We call this diaphragmatic breathing. I actually hate that term. I don't use it because uh, the diaphragm is always working. Um, you know, we can call this belly breathing or um, just deep breathing. Um, and this is a great way to facilitate that type of technique. You can place your hand on the abdomen or on the lower rib cage and really facilitate a nice, you know, big breath. But again, diaphragm's always working, so I don't, I really don't like using that term. Um, that technique, right, to facilitate lower, um, you know, or, or, you know, lower abdominal belly breathing, not super effective for patients with COPD, just because their diaphragm's always super active, you know may not be the best thing, but you know, something you can, you can try there if you think they have a chest wall deficit. Um, but again, you know, um, it can be done you know, unilaterally over one segment, can be done bilaterally. If you, you, know, you want to get that really nice, you know, uh, lower lateral costal expansion, you can do it on the apical segments. You can do it anywhere you want if you think there's a chest wall deficit or if you want to encourage a bigger breath in a patient. Um, and they can also use their own hands sometimes too. Um, and then there are um, bracing techniques. So these are a little bit different than our facilitatory techniques. These are used for patients who have chest um, wall pain, right? So someone's got a rib fracture or maybe after a cabbage or coronary artery bypass graft, um, you know, they've got just pain in the rib cage, right? Either fracture or we've opened up the sternum in a cabbage. Um, so by pr providing a little bit of extra support, either using a hand or often a pillow, um, we can decrease pain and encourage, you know, normal breaths or ventilation to those segments. Again, one of the big problems for patients with rib cage fractures um, or bruises or cabbage where they have chest wall pain, they're not breathing into those segments uh, super well. If you're not breathing or ventilating those, those segments or expanding them, you've got a risk for developing atelectasis. If you don't, you know, treat the atelectasis that can develop into a pneumonia and you've got some other complications on top of having rib, you know, rib pain or a, you know, a, a bypass graft, a sternotomy, right? So um, you'll often see in hospitals, patients given these um, pillows, may look like a little heart or a teddy bear that they're encouraged to hold onto uh, when they cough or when they breathe, really to decrease the pain because we want them to take breaths, big normal breaths to not, you know, decrease expansion because they have pain. Um, which we often do. So if we can, you know, brace ourselves using a pillow or even our hands, facilitate chest wall expansion, but it's not like, you know, the, the, the lateral costal technique. This is a pain reducing technique. Again, brace breathing and splinted breathing is a pain reducing technique to encourage normal breaths, right? It's not um, something we're trying to, you know, cause really large expansion. We're trying to decrease pain to facilitate a normal expansion, right, to improve it from a deficit, right? So this is um, a little bit different than, than, than the other techniques. Similar thought process to encourage chest wall expansion, this is to decrease pain. Now there are other positions um, that you may uh, see used in, cl in the clinic to relieve dyspnea. So um, the idea is that patients often with lung you know, issues, especially with COPD, you have um, diaphragm weakness. Now, your diaphragm has a postural role. We'll get more into that later on. Um, so by you know supporting your back or supporting um, you know your trunk, you can unload the 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 the, the, the um, postural role of the diaphragm to allow it to um, you know act more in the ventilatory manner. But we can also see two patients have hands on contact on a table. Um, this allows a little bit more activity, you know, in a, you know, the, the scalenes to act on the chest wall to un, you know, help again unload the diaphragm. Same thing with, you know, hands or, you know, these guys with his elbows and his knees. Again, using the reverse action of the scalenes to encourage a little bit more expansion. Um, this is why a lot of patients with COPD 
tend to do a little bit better um, ambulating with a walker. I mean, they don't have a gait disturbance, um, but by having their arms supported and their trunk supported, one allows those accessory muscles, the scalene and cervicoidomastoid, to act on the chest, as well as pec minor, pec major, um, which unloads the diaphragm. And if they're using a walker, their trunk supported. So it, you know, again, helps you know decrease the postural control role of the diaphragm and allows it to do more ventilation. And then uh, the other side is if people are bent a little bit forward, um, it moves the abdominal contents this way and allows the diaphragm to expand a little bit more. So by even by being flexed forward a little bit um, can allow for a little bit more uh, mobility of the diaphragm to encourage, again, maybe a bigger grab. So that's why walkers for patients with COPD uh, work really well. Now, there are other things we can do, um, you know, thoracic mobilization, you know, juries for that is um, kind of out there a bit. Again, you know, maybe if someone has got a, you know, a thoracic deficit, we may want to treat this, but, you know, um, and we can see temporary improvements in lung volumes following with spinal manipulation. Is this going to have long-term benefits? Is this the go-to treatment that I use? Probably not. Um, am I going to be the one to teach you all about thoracic manipulation and, and chest wall mobility? No, I'm not. Um, we've got musculoskeletal faculty to cover that. Dr. Shroka, Dr. Uh, Wilichowski will cover that. Um, but again, there might be a, a place for this in, in a limited number of patients. Um, again, maybe there's probably more important things we could do with, the, with these patients generally. All right, so um, again, um, these were dentatory strategies. In the next lecture, we'll get into some airway clearance techniques to get, to get the secretions out.